Good afternoon, everybody. And thank you uh, to Indian for my, the possibilities for me to uh, join this webinar. And I'm very honored and uh, happy to try to share a bit of my knowledge. As, as Ariane told, I have a pretty extensive uh, knowledge about different types of materials and production. I'm originally from Denmark. I moved to Finland for 33 years ago. And I really, I started out, uh, as maybe some of you have noticed in my biography, working out within hard metals and uh, special high strength ceramics. And uh, I came to Finland to work in a company uh, which was making equipment for sintering and production of those high strength ceramics. But then I, due to the situation changes here in Finland, I moved into the biomaterials project in uh, Turku in uh, 89. And from that on, I have been involved in biomaterials. And I was lucky to join at the very early stage. So I have really been uh, interacting with all the pioneers uh, from the field. I have many times met most of the people like Larry Haynes and Google and so on. And we have had an extensive uh, research uh, here in Finland going on, and we will get into that a little later. I was involved in building up the first uh, uh, bioactive glass manufacturing here in Finland. And uh, then after that, I went into the Obo University, the Obo Academy University, which is a Swedish spoken university here in Finland, and I made my PhD there. After that, I was in a couple of years uh, working in a normal glass factory called Itala Glasswork, which is making art glass and high-end glasses. Then I again went into a little touch with the biomaterials production and things like that, and went out again and worked with the uh, production of uh, insulation materials. And many doesn't know that, but insulation materials is, a uh, matter of fact, a bioresolvable materials. There's a legislation from 96 that all production of glass wool and uh, stone wool can only uh, withstand uh, 40 days in a long environment. That means at the pH 4.5. And in 2019, I joined Active Biomaterials Oil, where I'm in charge of the glass uh, manufacturing and uh, the glass technology overall. Then we will go to the presentation. Okay, in this presentation, I will try to cover a little about the history of bioactive glasses, uh, both abroad and here in Finland. But first of all, when we are talking about bioactive glasses, we are talking about biomaterials. And really biomaterials, they can be uh, divided into three main categories. The first is of course the inert, which is the most common used, like titanium, aluminum oxide, zirconium, mostly for different type of implants and uh, so on. There's also polymers, which is used uh, for different things. Biodegradable and bioactive, they are then more or less similar materials uh, regulated from the same part. Biodegradable, there's polymers, there's glasses, there's some ceramics. And uh, for the bioactive, they are mainly uh, ceramics and uh, glasses. What is special about biomaterials if we uh, look at them compared to uh, all those, and especially the bioactive materials, they are that they have a certain surface reaction. This surface reaction leads to most often, what we want is a firm bond to the host uh, tissue. Uh, to some extent, it can also include the uh, soft tissues. Many of those uh, bioactive uh, Materials you find as a uh, calcium phosphate, a hydroxy appetite, uh, glass ceramic, like the Coco glass, the AWG glass, and there have been some other also developed. And uh, then of course, it's some normal type of glass, let's say in that way. If we are looking at how the different biomaterials or bioactive materials that react, often the bioactive glasses are the most fast glasses to, re to react. And then we'll come back to that a little later. Then we get into the glass ceramics. They're a bit slower. And the slowest material is uh, the different types of uh, hydroxyapatite. 
and if we're looking at it, okay, what been the most prominent within them uh, in that circle that I have been working is Larry Hens, of course, with the bio, bio glass, which is invented. And uh, then we have Tashita Kokobo from uh, Japan, who was working very extensively in the beginning of the 90s with the AW glass ceramics. And for instance, I want to mention about the hydroxy apatite is uh, glad to grow from Leiden University in the Netherlands. Uh, if we're looking at the characterization of a glass, uh, the term glass, it does not really uh, tell you a lot. It's more a broad sense that collectively covers a lot of different materials because you can have all the materials we can be in a uh, glass state. There's some polymers, but you're also talking about glassy metals. Uh, and that is very fast quench metals, and they really uh, behave like a glass. You have also glassy carbon, the way you are making carbon fiber and so on. And uh, so many times when you're talking about the glass, it can also be uh, something else than what we are namely thinking of as a glass, a drinking glass or something like that. If we're looking at normal glasses, what is the raw materials that is used? It's sand, it's a silicate parts. That is the main component in many of the glasses. You have also other type of glasses which is um, based on calcium phosphate. So you have calcium phosphate glasses. Then you have solda. It's a uh, sodium carbonate. It's really the same material as you use in the, uh, your kitchen as uh, the solder that you're using when you're uh, cooking. Then you have limestone, lime, calcium carbonate. You have uh, potassium and then other components, depending on what type of glass you're making, if it's a window glass or if it's a drinking glass or if it's a crystal glass or anything like that. Now, this year was mainly for the normal glasses. Uh, Bioactive glasses, they differed to somewhat from this year. Then uh, we are talking about the blend. And uh, sometimes in uh, England, you also, in English language, you also hear some people talking about Mengen, which is from Swedish, and it's really coming from the German word Gemengen. And it's really just the mix of the raw materials which you are melting into the furnace for some 10, 12 hours. If we are looking at the structure of glass, uh, the first picture, the upper picture here, is showing a normal quartz glass where you only have silica, which is the small black dot, and oxide. And uh, this is the silica network. When you start to modify the glass and you start to add uh, sodium to re reduce the melting temperature, calcium in order to improve some properties of the glass and so on, you start to break up the bonds. So you get into another type of uh, bonding structure for the silica network. And this is also the idea with bioactive glasses that the bonds are broken up and uh, you can work with the glass in a different way. So when we are looking at the silicon network, the quartz glass is what we, you're calling a Q4 dominates. That means that you have the four oxygen atoms that is bonding to and it's very inert glass. It's only very strong acids which can attach uh, and uh, nothing else really. If you go down in the amount of silica, then you start to have a lot of those uh, oxygen bridges uh, uh, broken, and then you start to get into a, a Q3 and, and Q2 dominates. And Q2 is the one that we are really interested in when we are talking about glass, which is uh, reacting in a different environment. And that's why we are starting to get with the high silica content. The, I resolve the uh, glasses and they can often be uh, oxidal conductive. When we're getting down in lower silica content, we're getting into the bioactive glasses, which also some, uh, many often shows to be uh, osteopromotive. So 
the bioactive glasses, they are really designed for giving a spatial biological activity. So you trigger the environment to and the cells to believe that this is something that we can work with. And uh, to say it strongly also, it, it can be say it's an intimate between something which is 100% resolvable and something which is uh, bio-inert. So that's very, if we are looking, now we're coming into the history. Really, where did we start? It's really started with Larry Hinch, if we're looking at the, the bioactive glasses. There have been some glass around before that, and the drugs have been for that, but really way back in around 1966, 1967, Hinch started to work with this uh, bioglass. And the history behind it, he, I was so lucky to work with him several times in the laboratory here in, the, in Finland. And I also visited him and his wife, June Wilson Hens in uh, London. And we was invited home to them. And uh, that, uh, Larry told the history behind uh, how he developed this here. And it can also be found in a different publication around but uh, he was in the uh, mid 60s involved in uh, some different army project and one was developing special glasses for storage of uh, atomic waste. And there was, uh, there was a colonel asking him, uh, why couldn't one develop some materials which could help them to uh, help their boys which was wounded in the Vietnam War. And, uh, so he really got this, Miracle, as he said himself, to get different chances at one uh, time. He got funding from the, the army, he got a challenge from the army, and he really stumbled over uh, some glasses we was working. And what he really told me was that the, he'd sent, he made different glasses to make this triangle. And they sent them to Vietnam and they were then implanted into the soldiers, the wounded soldiers. And then uh, one early morning, the doctor from uh, Vietnam called the and said, hey, we, we are in deep shit right now. We can't get the glass out. So it had bonded to the bone and then they have been working with it in that way that they have put it in. And uh, it had been sitting there for some time, and then they have taken it out and uh, gone on. But then, then at some point, there was one glass which was not coming out, and that was the bio glass. One thing they also noticed about the uh, bioactive glasses or bioresolvable glasses, very often also uh, calculate the bro uh, blood, so they stop the bleeding. And that was why they really were starting in the beginning. So when uh, Hens got this uh, knowledge, he started to work further on that and uh, develop this triangle more. Uh, here in Finland, uh, we also was working and mainly in the beginning was what I would call the first generation of bioactive glasses. And, and that was, for instance, Erlian Andersson from Oba Academy University uh, who made this dissertation in 19. And Larry Hens was the opponent of that uh, dissertation. So, uh, that was the first encounter that we really had with uh, Hinch and then we did well with after that. But that uh, was extended a little more to work with uh, a lot more elements than the four that uh, Hinch was using. We have to remember this triangle is made with a 6% phosphor. It was kept uh, at that level. Where earlier he was using a more strategic uh, approach. Uh, we made a lot of uh, research around with those glasses here, and uh, one of the most well-known glasses from here is the S S three P four class from Turku. And uh, again, we came forward with there's limitation with this here, and then Nova Academy started to work further with that. Which I can hear calling the second generation of glasses, where that was moved into other, uh, other elements again in order to change how you can work with the glass. And uh, that is really based on the Maria Brink's uh, diploma work and uh, PhD work where she was uh, having her PhD in 97. And the opponent there was uh, Paul Duchesne. 
And uh, today, I would say we are now moving in, or uh, have moved in already to the third generation, which is very often based on the soldier classes. If we're coming back to Hench, very fast developed uh, theory on how uh, biological classes are working. And he put it into different stages, and sometimes you find it with six, sometimes you find it with more stages. But uh, this is the first one, uh, which is really uh, coming forward uh, very early in his research. And you have stage one and two, which is somewhat what I would say instance, it's happening within seconds when you implant the glass or you test it in, uh, in vitro. Stage three is a little more slower, but it already starts there in the beginning and carry on for a long, long time and move into stage four as well, which is where we are talking about maybe hours. Then uh, from four to five, we start to talk from hours up to one, two, three days, and five to six, we go up and go over seven, two weeks, four weeks, and so on before it's really getting in. Uh, to put it in a very short form, so what is happening in, you have the glass starting to uh, break up in the surface. You start to have a migration of uh, what is important here is the calcium and phosphate the ions, but also of course sodium and uh, the other component like potassium and so on, which is there. And they start to break down the silica network and uh, you can form the silica gel layer. And then the silica gel layer is really the surface which you uh, get the calcium phosphate rich layer to work on uh, or to grow on. And later on this year will then start to crystallize and form the well-known appetite form, hydro uh, uh, appetite form that you see in the bony tissue. If we still look at the first generation of bioactive glasses, what was we able to do with them? So it was really, we was able to cast them into blocks, mill it down to granules, uh, make some different shapes, mainly by cutting or direct casting. For instance, the first implant made from uh, the bioglass, it was an ear implant to uh, uh, use to win the hammer, I think was uh, broken or something like that. Um, I'm not 100% sure for uh, what it was, but it already came on the market in the early 80s. So it had been on the market uh, very long before we started to work on it uh, in Finland. If we're looking at how this type of material, bioactive glass, they react when you test them in in vitro, meaning when you test them in the laboratory in different uh, solution, Many people use an SPF with a simulated water fluid, but you can also use the most uh, simple solution like trees or anything else, depending on what you want to look at. But what is happening is that you really start to see layers forming in the materials. You see the glass, then you can find the silica rich layer, and you can find uh, hydroxyapatite. And uh, I have heard many people when you're looking at things like that, that they're very saying they're weak materials, they're cracking. But we have to remember that all the slices, all the samples that we take out and put into a scanning electron microscope or histological slice, they're dried out. And what is happening with the silica gel when it's drying is contracting a lot. And so therefore you get a lot of artifacts in the crack there. So it can sometimes be difficult to judge if the material really are strong or if it's weak because uh, when you dry it out, you change the structure of the, uh, of the hydrolyzed silica gel. And again, uh, general for all type of biomaterials, but basically bioactive glasses is that when you implant them in the bony tissue, then you again get the same reaction layer. You get the glass, the silica rich layer, you get the calcium phosphate and you get a very firm bond from the calcium into the bone. And then many, many people uh, have been wondering, why are we uh, getting this firm bond and why is happening in that way? And, uh, and then uh, I was told by uh, 
a person, a professor from uh, New Zealand, Tom Carlos, that what is really happening is that um, when you have the cells around that, the osteoplast cells, they're really a calcium phosphate pump. And so that means that when you have an excess of calcium and phosphate, they try to precipitate it as hydroxyapatite or calcium phosphate. And then again, if you're looking at urinary bones, that means bones from uh, growing uh, children, uh, it's very often misunderstood that the bone are not growing from the middle, but they're growing from the end. And uh, if you look at the growth zone there, it's really happening on the silica rich layer, which is in, uh, in children. So that's explain a little about uh, how bioactive glass interfere or interact with the environment with, and with the cells around uh, the implantation site. Some of the first uh, clinical studies that I was involved in was really in the head and neck surgery. And uh, we had different places that we put in. Here we see uh, clinical pictures, x-ray pictures from uh, what is called the blowout fracture, which is really an, uh, things which can happen. It can from an accident, uh, car accident, or you have been fighting and somebody hit you in the eye and the orbital floor plate broke. Uh, it can also be cancer, uh, other diseases. And what we really did uh, way back, or what I did was by hand sit, manufacturing small different shapes of glass plates, which were then put in under the eye here. And it was just inserted between the eye and, and the skin. And we uh, was, place like this here and, uh, and the patient was really able to read the newspaper in the day after the operation. But again, this is the first generation and then uh, we were very limited. So we started really to look at, okay, with the first generation plates, particles, powders, but we really needed something else in order to get into porous implants some fiber reinforcement and things like that. That was really uh, what we wanted uh, at that time also. And we was at that time also starting to work a lot with the Tampere area university here, which was uh, working with uh, biopolymers and they were interesting in getting biopolymers uh, strengthened also. So there was a, a lot of work going on there. And uh, then, My teacher at Oberon University put it into this that we say, okay, we use the hinge triangle and start to see what is happening there. And really when we are looking at what we need, there's three needs when we're looking at the implant material. There's the clinical application, what it really needs. Then again, is the bioactivity, the bio, uh, bio uh, behavior of the materials, what we really would like it to do. And then we have to look at, we should be able to manufacture the implant and things like that from it in a neat way. So we have this triangle interaction there and we need to, uh, really to try to pull fail all of them. And that was what I said at that time was to, which led to us to extend uh, to the second generation where I also, among others, I made my uh, thesis when I was making for optimization of the biomarker uh, glass, trying to see both on the uh, manufacturing properties, but also uh, biological properties. And it can be fine in my thesis. But really, again, we see when you are working with the bioglass or any glass, you have really three main components. You have the network formers, which for bioglass and only those being uh, used here, there's also aluminum which is going into this group, but the uh, aluminum is, uh, when you're talking about bioactive glasses, is uh, not a really bonded uh, material, due to that uh, it inhibits the contact with bone in the uh, long term. Then you have the alkaline earth metals, of course there's more than this here. Uh, to some extent, new people there are Researchers have been trying to work with it and strontium have been moved in and they've been added here as well. 
uh, for the glass ornaments that uh, you're using for the tooth filling materials, uh, and uh, you're using uh, barium oxide, which is a heavy element, so it's very uh, helpful to get made it visible in the X-ray and CT scans. And uh, I, together with uh, one of my research colleagues, it was really interesting to see what was the amount of barium you could add to uh, uh, bioactive glass, and it was still bioactive, and we got up to 7%, and then we stopped and say, okay, that is far enough. And then, of course, the alkaline, and then with bioactive glass, we are only interested in those two for some of the alkaline materials that you are using in the glass industry uh, will be uh, a bit toxic. So it's not really interesting to use them. But uh, when we went into working with the second generation, what did we really uh, get? One thing was later the coating of glass on the titanium implant. Uh, of course, we started to make fibers and glass, which could be centered like uh, the virus doll. This is really one of the first tests before we got to uh, really start working with virus doll, but it's made together here with people in Tampere. The same with this screw here, it's also made with people here in Tampere, where we made some fibers and they put fibers into it. We made round granules, which was just put in like a round, rounded granules here. But at the same time here in the Tampere, they also started to work on making centered pieces of this round uh, granules. And that is really uh, the start of the Biorestore uh, idea, I think. And this is, I think, uh, late 90s that this year was made. And uh, what is really the idea of making a centered body is that, I think the porous body is that you increase the total reactive area and you gave a three dimensional. If you're looking at the normal cut plates, it's a two dimensional. But here you get a three dimensional where you can get the bone ingrowth to come into it, but also by having that is open porous, also the cells will go in. So you will also be able to start forming bone inside the implant, which is then growing outwards. So you get a faster good bonding between the implant and the surrounding bones. And if we are coming to how I'm looking at the future for this year. Uh, yeah, I think the future looks bright because there is a need for those materials. Uh, there is some obstacle. Uh, I think we'll be continuing quite a lot the way that we're going today. Uh, new bioactive glasses, there might come some up uh, to, uh, through research, but to get them into clinical use is a long-term journey. And it's getting longer and longer all the time. In the beginning, it was a little bit faster, but today it's really, Many years one has to uh, go through all the things. Then we are talking about the composite materials of polymers and uh, glass or polymers and ceramics and things like that. And I think that a lot of the, those things have already been uh, explored and some smaller development will be made there, but uh, I don't think that there will be any huge leap there either. Uh, the huge leap will come from the sodium glasses because of uh, the way that you're making a soil gel, you can make different uh, structures, you can make uh, different surface structures and things like that. You can really uh, play with the soil gel to uh, a different part. And there you will really start to be able to move into tissue engineering uh, in a little better way than you can do with the normal biomaterials that we are working with. And, until now, until today, what I have understood is that the cell gel materials, they are mainly prone within the uh, tissue engineering, but a few have come, and uh, I know there's been some work done with uh, 
titanium soldier coating on titanium implants, and there have been shown that there's a good possibility that they are bonding to both bone tissue and soft tissue. So you will be able to have an improvement there, but bacteria will not get in through the surface area where the implant is in contact with the, the soft tissue. And then, of course, one thing which everybody is talking about is 3D printing. And I see also a huge possibilities for biomaterials move into the area of 3D printing because we already have been working with the different types of materials within 3D printing for a long time. The first 3D printer that I saw was way back in the middle of the 80s, which was done where you were really curing a solution with a laser. So that is really maybe possible to do that also with the different soldiers. <clears throat> and then you have uh, all the ceramic and um, uh, metal-based 3D printing where you're using a powder that can be done with the glass powder. And then of course, uh, you also have 3D printing which is done with the polymer. And there you can do it with the polymer core, which have been reinforced by uh, glass, other as a powder, or it can also be a, a drug appetite or something like that. But what we need to do there is really try to get them optimized. And then moving on to my last slide. I want to uh, thank you all for listening to me here. And I also want to thank all the people that I've been so lucky to work with through the years and all the input interaction I've got from them. Because without all that different interaction in the uh, research environment, we will not have been able to go so far as we have been today. And uh, I'm really thankful for being able to have been able to work in this society for so long time and been able to meet a lot of very important people within this area. So thank you.